Should you read this fucking book? Yeah, you should. You should read this fucking book. It's, it's pretty good. Actually, let me qualify that statement. Um, if your initial reaction to the to the title, "The Unbearable Lightness of Being," is that uh, this is some shit pseudo philosophy up its own ass pretentious garbage, that's exactly what this fucking book is. Whereas, on the other hand, like me, if you hear the title The Unbearable Lightness of Being and you go, hmm, what is The Unbearable Lightness of Being? I'd like to know more. Then, of course, that's what this book is. About. So, literature for me uh, is, is something that I read to sort of learn more about life. So, the philosophy of this book, is, insofar as existentialism is probably the primary theme by which you can categorize it, is... Uh, what justifies it is that it's a more insightful explanation of this conundrum, okay? Some people react to the statement that life has no meaning as celebratory. Uh, they get a sense of freedom from it, you know? It's like, ah, thank God, nothing matters. That means I can do what I want. I can choose my own values. I can be myself without all these expectations or whatever, because I, I don't relate to that philosophy. But I know a lot of people who find nothing matters as a, as a good thing, as a positive thing that makes them feel better about life and about themselves. The statement, life has no meaning, nothing matters, for me, causes despair. <laughs> I do not like that feeling. Uh, it's deflationary. Um, it causes uh, feelings of fleeting meaning and it dissolves everything it touches and when I think about it, uh, it just sort of deflates any agency I have in my life and makes me bummed out and just want to curl up and listen to Frank Sinatra or something. Um, so those two things, kind of like, you know, my boy Spike Spiegel versus Shinji, uh, life has no meaning. You can react in either of these ways. Um, you're probably emotionally inclined to one of those versus the other. I don't know why. Bother some people, it doesn't bother others. Um, so this book is useful insofar as I, th I think it helps you understand that distinction and that conundrum better. Why do some people like it that life has no meaning? While for me and others, it's fucking terrible. Um, maybe it's part of this distinction between lightness and weight. So here's what makes this book especially worthwhile. For example, if someone like Hemingway, what you're talking about is a unilateral perspective on life. You're learning about how Hemingway feels about certain things. Uh, what bothers Hemingway? Uh, how does Hemingway respond to all these certain things? Um, so that's good if, if you're interested in certain perspectives, but Kundera has a much more Dostoevskian approach to things, um, where he utilizes these characters to explore the same issues and same phenomena from different perspectives. So what that enables is uh, a more holistic understanding and exploration of these certain things that Kundera is interested in. So one example along these lines is, for example, coincidence, uh, which one character views as beautiful, another causes despair. Um, for example, Kundera explores how all these tiny chance occurrences that brought two lovers together, uh, the small things that were out of their control. Um, uh, one character reacts to that with despair. The arbitrariness of the relationship is undermining of its value for him. Um, it, it fills him with dread and it makes the relationship seem less special. Uh, whereas the other character reacts to this series of coincidences that were out of their control as beautiful, as almost fate. Um, and, and it makes her appreciate the relationship even more. So much like Dostoevsky, Kundera is using different characters to explore the same uh, issues from different perspectives, and that makes it much more relatable. So in this uh, Dostoevsky approach, I don't know what else to call it, just follow me here. This ties into another thing that I think makes the book more mature and more worth reading, uh, especially in your 20s like I am. Um, and that's that it, you can contrast it directly to other strands of existentialism, uh, such as Sartre's, Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialism, which, if you're like me, it was like your Bible in high school, because you read it and it's all about, oh, your life is under your control, everything you make is a decision, make every decision as if you were living your life uh, for the second time, and you didn't want to make any mistakes, and have no regrets, and it's like, uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, empowering. Uh, to a degree, and then you grow older and you, you sort of get a more nuanced um, perspective on life and on yourself when you get to understand yourself better. <clears throat> and what Kundera does here, I think, is sort of explore existentialism from a more interpersonal relationship um, and in a way that takes personality 
uh, psychology, uh, inclinations, uh, dispositions, all of these things that are a part of us, that are constitutive parts of us, um, it takes that more into account instead of just giving us this abstract uh, sort of diatribe about choice and freedom and wah. Um, Kundera seems to understand much more so than Sartre that people do have predispositions, that some people are more extroverted, some people uh, react to certain things differently. This book understands that the uniqueness of our own childhood has a huge element in determining who we are years down the line, and that a lot of the ways that we go about our behavior, such as what we want out of relationships, what we value in life, a lot of that is determined by what happened in childhood. And what that understanding does is lend a much more emotionally sophisticated understanding of existentialism to this text, as opposed to someone like Sartre. Kundera seems to understand that we can't just restructure our entire personality with the cognition and with the force of will alone. This book understands that, and because of that, um, because it takes personalities actually into account, because it actually treats the characters as characters with personalities and emotions instead of just this abstraction away um, towards the ideal sort of human will we get a much more sophisticated and relatable understanding um, and alongside the Dostoevsky approach what's interesting about this book is maybe you'll agree with one character on say coincidence but you'll agree with another character on the value of privacy in a sexual relationship. Or maybe you'll agree with another character on the value of fidelity versus infidelity. So what's great about this book is if you're interested in those existential themes, um, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> I think most people are interested in that, especially if you're a reader, and especially if you're interested in a book called The Unbearable Lightness of Being. You're probably predisposed to uh, find that an interesting question. Um, but it's it's definitely an emotionally and philosophically dense book that you will get a lot out of uh, that you will get a lot out of on an existential reading of things. The irony is not lost on me in what I'm about to say, because I'm about to go over the ways in which Dostoevsky does this thing better. And obviously, this is a book about Soviet imperialism and how terrible the Soviets were. And now I'm saying the Soviet or the Russian writers were better? Like, eh, that is kind of ironic, but it's true. Um, here's what Dostoevsky does better. Much like Kundera, he uses his characters to represent abstract things, um, to explore, and then he throws them into this world in some gumbo of philosophical interest in like a witch's cauldron and just stews it together. What Dostoevsky does much better is that the characters themselves are interesting beyond the philosophical idea they're supposed to represent. Um, in Brothers Karamazov, uh, in Brothers, Kara Kara in Brothers Karamazov, uh, Alyosha himself is an interesting character. Uh, he represents a certain ideal or a certain debate, um, but he himself is an interesting character that you will remember after the book's over. Can't say that about Kindera. I can't say that about this book. The characters are less interesting than what they represent. Um, they are not all that captivating on their own. You don't really care that much about what happens to them. Um, they are, they're fleshed out. So they're fleshed out. They're good characters. They feel fully realized. Uh, you, you have a very profound understanding of their psychology throughout the course of the book. So these are good characters. They're just not interesting characters that you're going to remember. You're going to remember Tomas for what he represents instead of Tomas himself. And similarly, the story is not all that interesting in this book. And that's a pretty big criticism because, like, it, once again, comparing to Brothers Karamazov, a uh, philosophical diatribe, big stew of philosophy and ideas. Um, but the story is gripping, and it's like a page-turner, and you want to know what happens next because you care about the characters, and the story is actually entertaining. This one feels a lot more just meandery, and the chronology is all over the place, and that doesn't really lend too much to it. It's just sort of... What makes this book readable is that you're not spending too much time with these characters. You'll spend a couple chapters with them, that's maybe 30 pages, and that gives a briskness, a brisk, and that gives a briskness to it. Um, because if you were to spend too much time with these characters, you would get bored, and you would get bored about what's going on with these stories because they aren't that interesting it's like oh this character just went for a walk with her dog like uh, and she thought about her mother 
I don't give a fuck about that. I give a shit about the insights that are going to come from that, but I don't care about the situation that Kundera is talking about. Um, so that's a pretty big criticism, obviously, is that the story isn't that interesting. As characters, they aren't the most compelling, riveting characters, to be honest. They didn't make me cry. I'm not going to miss them after it's over. I don't feel like they're friends. Um, um, so you don't get that here. You don't get a uh, masterful Dostoevsky and marriage of fascinating storytelling with gripping characters and unbelievably profound philosophical insights. Here you get fully realized characters that are kind of boring, a story that's kind of boring, uh, with some very insightful philosophy. There's also some shit in here that uh, is unintentionally funny, and this is a pretty serious book. It doesn't have a sense of humor, unlike someone like Dostoevsky. Again, this book is very dry and sad and somber and melancholic, and I'm running out of adjectives. Um, but there's this one character that whenever uh, she has sex, she uh, screams at the top of her lungs. Screams at the top of her lungs. Um, and Kundera is using that uh, as an analogy to draw a distinction between the soul, which is having sex, and the body, which is the physical mechanism, which is having sex. But the imagery it provokes is this chick fucking screaming at the top of her lungs for having sex. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Shut the fuck up. It's also like, I don't feel Kundera has any stakes in this. I don't feel his passion on the subject. Um, he definitely knows what he's talking about, especially when it comes to sex. Because, like I said, this guy fucked. Um, but it feels like it was written by a 60-year-old who's writing about his 40s. And that passion has sort of died down. So what we're getting is a more mature, wiser take on it. But it makes Kundera himself seem kind of, weirdly enough, disinterested in the subjects he's exploring. Um, so the philosophizing feels detached, clinical, and kind of abstractly philosophical. Instead, which is bizarre because the characters are so intimate and we're getting so close to their psychologies and we're just diving into them like Freud. <laughs> But I don't know, you just didn't have much of a fire under his ass. I, I didn't feel Kundera's pain in this. I felt Kundera, the wise old man, uh, with some expensive wine in a pipe uh, sitting in an armchair, you know. Um, and, you know, in comparison to other authors, someone like Michel de Montaigne or David Foster Wallace or Dostoevsky, like, this, their passion is fucking palpable and you feel their pain just like emanating through the text like they're bleeding like when you read the book you leave with bloody hands because it's such a fucking passionate confession don't get that out of this 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 it just comes across a bit more uh i don't know abstract and i guess the distinction here is that i like my authors to be as close as possible to the text i want to smell their blood while i'm reading I'll leave that in. <laughs> That's a weird fucking thing to say, but... Another thing worth mentioning is that this book is short, and it reads quick. Like, you're in, you're out. It's 300 pages, it's a large text, it moves along at a brisk pace, despite the story being kind of uninteresting. It's just paced well. You don't... If you don't like one plot line, don't worry, you're out of there pretty soon anyway. And it's a quick read. You could read this in, like, a weekend, you know? Like, you could bang this shit out if you just read all day Saturn, Saturday and uh, Sunday. It would go quick, it would go quick. Um, and that's something worth mentioning because as readers, we run into a problem that uh, fans of music or fans of film do not, which is opportunity cost, because it might take you 30 minutes to you know listen to an album or two hours to watch a movie. Books tend to take much longer than that, so we're always sort of anxious about, is this book worth my time? Because it's going to take up a lot of my time and I could have been reading something better during it. This book is quick. Like the opportunity cost is low on it. I don't know what to say. So, and then the other aspect of this book is big time horny hours. Big time. I did not realize how erotic this book was. This, this book is like 50-50 philosophy and the other half is just sex. Uh, and romance, but mostly sex. Um, and I don't know, I'm not a big fan of erotic stuff. I don't, don't really care about it. 
Um, so if you're into, you know, fucking talk books about fucking, uh, but you're kind of embarrassed to read it, you know, on the train and have people look at you reading some like twi Twilight explicit fan fiction or whatever the fuck you read, I don't know. If you're embarrassed about that, eh, you can pick it, you know, pick this up. Looks a little bit smarter. It's got this pretentious title. Little do they know on the bus that you're just reading a, a fucking sex scene. Um, and along these lines, this book seems to me very insightful about romance, um, about the nature of sexuality, about what people want out of relationships, about the types of philosophies and personal experiences that led them to become the type of lover uh, or sexual or romantic partner they are today. Um, and you'll get lots of great distinctions in this. He'll explore like so many themes on this, like the difference between privacy. Some people want a lot of privacy in their romantic relationships. Others want to just pour everything out and that's integral for them. Why is that? What does it reveal about one person versus the other? Are those two philosophies compatible even if they're antagonistic? I don't know. Read the book to find out. Thing is, right, thing is, personally I'm not interested in this shit. I just don't give a fuck. Um, I'm kind of an intuitive person when it comes to romance. I don't want to over-intellectualize it. It's a, to me it's a feeling and you just follow your heart and it's not that complicated. It kind of ruins the point to me to think so deeply about love and about romance. That's not what the shit it is. It's a gut feeling. It's part of who you are. But I realize that's just my sort of inclination. Um, so if you are someone who is really interested in the philosophy of love, if you really th think a lot about relationships and what you want out of a relationship and where you can compromise, what values need to be aligned, um, this book will be very insightful because it is, uh, like I said, 50-50. Half of the shit is just exploring the complexities of relationships and life and I'm sure it's very insightful along those lines if you're interested in that subject. But beyond just philosophizing about relationships is an erotic book and a lot of the book is discussing fucking and sex and this is another thing which I just didn't connect to. I, I <laughs> it's fucking weird to me man. <laughs> like I don't want to be reading erotica. It's strange. Um, it's not erotic to me. It's not a turn on or anything. It doesn't get me all hot and bothered. I just like, eh, the, you know, the Puritan creeps out of me and is like, this is sinful. Um, like there's one scene, for example, uh, where one character is talking about how he loves fingering chicks anuses and how the anus is <laughs> his favorite part of the female body. Um, and he calls it a sphincter. And then, uh, in a striking move, she starts reverse fingering his anus, you know, with like a Uno card. And the book is describing two people in their 40s fingering each other's anuses. I'm sorry, I, <laughs> that doesn't make me want to jerk off, it makes me want to throw up, <laughs> like I don't know what to say. And the word anus is just like not, <laughs> not a sexy word for me. Same with sphincter. <laughs> I don't ever want to hear sphincter in the fucking bedroom, okay? But I realize that's just a personal thing. I'm not interested in erotic literature. Um, if you are, uh, this is probably as good as it gets. I don't know. I don't have a frame of reference for it. It's just fucking weird to me. So if you're interested in existentialism, if you're interested in uh, understanding the human condition from an existential perspective in terms of what do you need, uh, what sort of values do you hold, deep in your heart that you might even not be able to say explicitly, um, but that distinguish you from other people uh, in terms of this dichotomy of lightness and weight, which he explores in this and which I don't want to A, spoil and B, he says it better than I do. So just listen to me. If you're interested in that, it's for you and it's a quick read and give it a read.